Hey everyone, welcome to a conveyor meetup. We're super excited to share this new tool with you guys. Um, just some housekeeping rules. If you have questions, please put it in the chat. We're going to get to it at the end of the session. That way the presenters have enough time to um, get through all the material. And if we, and if you have a question that we don't get to, feel free to go to the conveyor Slack channel and just ask there. I'll put a link to that Slack channel um, in the chat as well. So that way you have access to it. And with that, I'm going to pass it on to John. Thanks, Jonathan. And thanks everyone for listening today. So uh, I'm John Refrano. I'm a senior technical staff member at IBM Research. I'm joined by my colleague, Rural Krishna, who is a research staff member. And we're going to talk about a project that we've been working on in the conveyor community called Data Gravity Insights. So what we're going to discuss, I'm just going to talk briefly about kind of the problem we're solving. Uh, we're going to look into a, just a broad overview of DGI, of Data Gravity Insights. And then Rahul is going to take you through a deep dive. Um, hopefully not too deep, but he's going to go deep. <laughs> uh, we're going to, you know, open the hood and show you what's inside because we want you guys to help us to build this, right? This is not all built. Uh, he's going to do a demonstration of DGI, and then we'll come back and talk about some future work that the community can help us with. So application modernization, right? Making little ones out of big ones, or, you know, taking this monolith, which largely is organized by technologies front end application back end you know not around business domains right so you want to break them up into microservices that are kind of business driven so why would i want to do this i'm going to take this monolith and it's i got this one thing that works great i'm going to break into a lot of little things and make a headache for myself well what you want to do what your, your primary goal should be i got 50 programmers working on this monolith and i want to have 10 teams of five programmers working much faster around business domains. So how can I figure out what are the business domains in the monolith that I can wrap a small team around? And they could be autonomous and they could move quickly, right? That's really the thing is moving faster, right? Moving in market faster. So if you look at the state of the art today uh, and uh, any of the tools that will help you turn your monolith into microservices and they look, they scan the code. They scan the code, they find all these connections, you get some graph like this, you got a whole bunch of little things are all connected, lots of lines, trying to figure out, you know, what is the best way to slice between them? And usually they're looking at, you know, how often do they call each other, you know, things like that to understand where is the place to partition. But, you know, just the dependency between the clusters isn't enough. We need to understand where are the big gas giants that are lurking? right, in your application? What are those objects that everything gravitates to? Because those are probably the center of a microservice, right? So we want to understand these heavy objects. That's what we call the data gravity insights. Uh, we want to understand how do we find these heavy objects that may be the, the center point of, of a microservice, and then all these other things are kind of orbiting around those things. So we take a little different approach. Like, what's the most important thing to the customer? the data that they persist. It was important enough that they persisted it in a database. Hello, the data is kind of important. You can't just look at the code. So we took the approach of, yeah, the code, code graph, application call graph, important stuff. What about the schema? What about the relationships between the schema? And then you take the third leg of that and say, what about the transactions between the code and the data? All of that has to be taken into account. So Data Gravity Insights is looking at a holistic approach, right? Look at the code, look at the data. How is the code accessing the data? When is it accessing it, right? So you want to understand and get a holistic view of your application and how it's put together. So if I look at the call graph, right? This is, uh, this is from the famous day trader, right? But I've got, you know, account data beans and quote data beans and market summary beans and stock beans, all sorts of beans, right? <laughs> Lots of beans in here. Um, so, and there's call graph between them. Then I look at the schema. Nobody's looking at the schema. I look at the schema and I've got an account table and a quote table. And there are some foreign keys between maybe the holding table and the quote table. So now I've got a different view of uh, the application where I can see foreign key relationships. I can see what tables have other foreign keys into, into other tables. That's a whole bunch of relationships in the domain, right? If you want to understand the business domain, look at the schema. 
because usually DBAs do a pretty good job of ignoring technology, which is, you know, the front end, back end stuff. And they're just dealing in the business domain. So you look at the schema. Then you overlay these views on top of each other. And now you can see, hey, I've got some calls being made at the code level that aren't represented in the schema. I've got some things done in the schema that maybe aren't represented in the code. Um, and so I can see those paths, but I also want to find those gas giants. I want to find those heavy objects and then say, these look like the center of a microservice. And as I look at this partitioning, I can see here are my APIs, all those red lines, those blue, the, the, these, these are the guys that are going to call each other across partitions. And so this is how I have to build my API. The problem is that's just a 2D view of the world, like an X-ray, right? X-ray is fine. I can see broken bones and stuff, but I, you know, I don't know what's going on behind all that white stuff. And that's that I, myopic view, I think, of just that 2D flat plane. What we need is an MRI. I need to be able to take the code and turn it around and look under it and see, you know, pull these things apart, see who's really talking to who, right? Different filters, different ways of looking at the code. Extremely, extremely important to understanding all the different relationships in the code. So what I want to do is kind of tilt that view and look under it and be able to see how those relationships are coming together. Uh, and we don't have this view yet. Don't get too excited. We want you to help us build this view. But we think we have all the underpinnings, right? We've got all the stuff inside that we need to go build views like this. And we started to build them using some tools like Bloom and, and Rahul is going to show you that. So what we're trying to do is get this holistic view of the application, the data, the source code, the transactions between them to understand who's talking to who. You know, when do I have to to, uh, to partition? When do I have to partition these things and how should I partition? So just to go through some of the possibilities and then we'll go into the technical stuff. So clearly queries to run and understand the dependencies. Those are things that we've already built. Um, triangulating the database, the code, dynamic calls and all that. Very important. Right now, we're just taking a static view of the world. It'd be nice to add a dynamic view of a call, you know, when we're at, watch the application run. Because it's important to understand. If this code calls this other code, well, does it call it once it's startup? Does it call it a thousand times a second? That's a really different relationship. So it's important to understand dynamic. And then find the data centrality and the code centrality. Right? So these are the important things in the code. These are the important objects in the data. How do they relate to each other? So can I find classes that are accessing the data outside of that centrality? Now I got distributed transactions. And what do I do about those? Do I refactor my data? Do I refactor my code? Or do I create a distributed transaction or do something like a saga pattern, right? So very important to understand. And then can I find these anchor classes, these entry points? You know, if you, if you view this graph with all these bubbles around it and you say, hey, this is really important object. Look, everybody's pointing to it. And then you find out it's a servlet. It's the entry point to the system. Of course, everybody, everybody has to come through it, but it's not an important business object. It's just a router. It's just a traffic cop. But then can we annotate the class to say, okay, this one is an entry point, right? So we do some annotation on the classes, which we don't have yet, which we hope to add, right? With, with, hopefully with the community. Um, and then what about the framework being used? So if I know a little bit about the framework, I'm using Spring Boot and what am I using? I'm using some model view controller. Now I can say, okay, can I label the classes? These are model classes. These are view classes. These are controller classes. That's gotta be important information when you're trying to figure out how to refactor this application. And then identify things like utility classes. Again, I've got this one class, everybody points to it. It's like, yeah, it's the log class. You know, No, no, it's not the most important thing in the system. It's the least important thing in the system. It's a utility class. You just copy it into all the microservices. But it's important to understand that. And we've done some work to identify utility classes and say, okay, take all those little utility classes, get them out of my view. They're just clouding up the view. I want to see the business objects. So what can you come up with? I mean, this is what we really want to do here today with a meetup is say, we want to show you what we've done and say, come help us build more of this. We've got some foundational work done, um, but there's lots of possibilities and we're hoping that you guys can help us create those possibilities. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Raul. 
He's going to do a technical deep dive. He's going to give you the theory behind it. Um, and he's going to do some hands-on demonstrations of what we have today in our conveyor uh, repo for DGI. So, Raul, I'm going to take it over. All right. Thanks. Thanks, JR. Um, so we'll do a quick deep dive. Uh, I've broken this down into two parts. We, we look at data gravity insights a little closer into what it's comprised of, how we build the graph, uh, and how we can visualize some of the use cases uh, JR mentioned. Uh, and then we look at Cargo, um, an approach that we built on top of DJI to partition monolithic applications into potential microservice recommendations. So DJI comprises, this is the overview of DJI, right? So we start with the source code uh, and we package it. Uh, into a, a, a one of many formats. And then we extract three uh, key relationships from the application. Uh, these are code to graph relationships, uh, schema and transaction relationships. Once we have these, uh, we persist them in a graph database and this permits us to use uh, query languages like Cypher to look for interesting insights that we can get. So code to graph uh, understands the static uh, dependencies between the various methods, the instructions, the classes that we have in the application. Uh, these dependencies we've categorized into call return dependencies, uh, data flow dependencies, and heap allocation and their corresponding dependencies. In addition to that, we have schema to graph, which looks at specifically the relationship between the database tables and the columns in the database. Uh, and these are a few examples could include foreign key relationships and, and, and others. And finally, we have transaction to graph, which looks at transactional CRUD operations between the source code and the database tables. Uh, these could be via transactional reads and writes and so on. And we, we wanted to populate the graph with this information to complete the view. So what does this give us, right? So um, this enables us to analyze the source code dependencies. So we know which classes talk to which other classes, where the utility classes are, and uh, which, class, which, which classes have a lot of traffic, and so on. In addition, it gives us code to database dependencies. And this tells us how the source code interacts with uh, external resources or persistent databases. In addition to this, we have database to database dependencies, which allows us to look at how the various tables in different databases communicate with one another and what relationship they have. And finally, we would like to think of this as a continuous modernization approach, where we look at runtime statistics and operational traces and telemetry from uh, tools like Jaeger and Instana. So the question here is, what can we do with this data? Um, so here are some examples that uh, we can we can build. Uh, these include transaction scopes, looking at various data synchronization issues, uh, and inspecting call and control dependencies. In addition, this allows us to look for potential RESTful service transformation. Uh, we can identify opportunities for code and data refactor and maintenance, identify distributed transactions, and come up with remediation strategies to handle these distributed transactions, as well as other synchronization issues across services. So how does DJI work, right? So I want to do a quick demo of how we could interact or how we would interact with DJI and how we can inspect the graph that we've built. We have a getting started guide on the conveyor um, repository page that gives you detailed instructions on how to start using DJI for your application. It's available as a pip package. So um, all you'll need to do is install DJI using pip. And then um, the rest of the instructions are here. Uh, they're pretty detailed. So I'll just go over the uh, commands themselves and what they do. So once you install the pip package, the command line uh, it's, uh, tool is DJI, and I start with DJI help, and this should give us an overview of what our tool contains. So there are a few options that allows us to interact with the graph database, as well as some um, command line options like verbosity and, and other information. But the key 
the key component of DJI are a set of commands that helps us build this graph. Um, here are a few. Uh, there is C to G, which stands for code to graph. And this uh, allows us to add the call return dependencies, heap dependencies, and other things to the graph. We have, I'll skip over partition for now. We have schema to graph or S to G, which passes the SQL uh, schema potentially through a DDL file into the graph and transaction to graph or TX to G, which adds edges that denote the CRUD operations in the graph. And finally, we have partitions. Uh, and I'll do another deep dive in the next part of this talk about what this is. But on a very high level, a uh, partition is a command that runs this algorithm that I'll discuss called Cargo, which enables us to identify potential partitioning strategies in the DGI graph. So to use DGI, uh, once we've uh, followed the getting started page and we have an application, uh, we can call one of these subcommands. Uh, I'm just going to show one example. And this is code to graph. And the help here should provide more in, in details on what it does. But essentially, code to graph takes uh, a directory that contains a lot of data that we've mined from the application. You can provide an abstraction level, uh, depending on what abstraction we want to look at. This could be class, method, or full, which includes class, method, and instruction. Uh, and once we do that, let me this will take a while. But it's going to go through the data, the program, and start populating the Neo4j graph with a lot of dependencies. So right now, it's doing heap carry dependencies. And uh, this is going to take a while because there are thousands of relationships to populate. So what I've done for the sake of this demo is I have a running example uh, after running code to graph in DGI. And I'll show you how uh, we can interact with it. So this is Neo4j desktop. Uh, there is uh, a graph database that's, that's running underneath, which has all the relationships that we are populating. Uh, and there are a couple of ways to interact with it. Uh, and today, I'll talk you, I'll walk you through Bloom. Uh, there is also uh, the browser, which we can use to interact and run some queries. So Bloom is a graphical user interface that comes with the Neo4j desktop. And this is what it looks like. This is a very high level overview. Um, we can think of the, the data that we have in DJI in terms of perspectives. There is a class perspective, which looks at all the code dependencies. And there is a database perspective, which looks at the class dependencies as well as the SQL table and the dependencies between the databases. So we can look into the uh, into this one. So we have uh, two types of nodes, the class node and the table node, and a number of relationships between all these nodes, like call return dependencies and foreign key relationships and so on. In addition to this, we have a set of queries that we've created. And these are just starter queries. As the use cases evolve, we can write more complex queries. As an example, uh, here is a query that we can use to identify data centrality. Now, and the search bar allows you to run the queries. And we can look for data centrality. And this should populate the graph that we see here with a number of relationships between the SQL table nodes that are shown in blue and the uh, class nodes, which are in gray. Uh, Bloom also allows us to um, add conditional rules to visualize these. So if you look at any of these uh, databases, for example, code EJB, there should be a centrality score that indicates how central that entity is uh, to the program. So higher value indicates it's more important, and the lower values indicate that it's uh, slightly less important. And there are rules that we can use to uh, differentiate between uh, the more, most important and the least important class. And in this view, we have an example where there is the, the database. The larger ones are more central, uh, the gas giants analogy, if you will. And the smaller nodes are less central to, to the application. And the edges between each of these indicate the transaction relationships in this view. Um, Bloom allows us to dismiss other nodes and inspect only uh, a few nodes if we choose to do, do so. And each database has a set of uh, properties associated with it. Uh, and so does every class. So for example, there is a centrality measure. This tells us the, the signature of the class, as well as if the class is a bean, if it's an entry point, if it's a servlet, uh, and other things. 
and each relationship uh, indicates the the nature of the transaction. So this is a transactional read. So the the class reads from the code EJB table. It tells us the method uh, that initiates this transaction read, as well as the uh, action that in, in initiated this. So this is just a quick overview of uh, of some of the options of DJI. Uh, in addition to looking at these, uh, we can also um, inspect individual classes uh, and to do that we um, I can look I can take one example over here this shows how the call return dependencies exist between classes so while this runs um, let me go back to the slides and discuss how we can use DGI for for some use cases. So to use DGI, in addition to looking at data centrality and uh, other um, factors, we can also uh, use it to identify potential refactoring strategies. One such example is to identify strategies to decompose a monolithic application into a set of microservices. And to do that, we uh, use DGI uh, and built an algorithm called Cargo, which was presented in a conference quite recently. Uh, and Cargo attempts to take the DGI graph and identify a microservice boundaries like we see here. And this is the overview of the approach. I'll go into uh, details on how, what each of these steps are. But in essence, we start with the DGI graph, which is the first step. And next, we identify snapshots. And I'll talk about what these are. And we apply the algorithm called context sensitive label propagation, which comes along with DGI to identify these microservice boundaries. So the first step is to build a program dependency graph. And this is the graph that we have in DGI. And this is just a technical terminology for that. Uh, we build what is known as a context sensitive program dependency graph. So if you look at DGI and every node, it has a context associated with it. Now, what a context is, is it emulates dynamic interactions in the program. Because we do a static analysis, we really don't have runtime information. And context sensitivity is a way to impart that runtime information into the program. And without context sensitivity, we might miss some key interactions that might only appear at runtime uh, and not at uh, static, time, static compile time. To give you a quick example of what this means, um, we have a quick example here with a, uh, it's, it's more of a pseudocode with a few classes and interactions. We have two objects of type A as shown here, and both of these objects call a.foo and b.bar in the other classes. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to run through this program. And on the left, you'll see a context insensitive graph that's being built. And on the right, we'll build a context sensitive graph. And by the end of this quick run through, we'll see the difference between context insensitive analysis and a context sensitive analysis. So the first step is we allocate an object, uh, A1, and it calls A.foo. Now in a context insensitive uh, graph, there is a call graph edge between main and a.foo. But on the right, we in a context sensitive analysis, it not only indicates that there is a call edge, but it also indicates which receiver object is instantiating that call edge. Uh, as we walk through the program, we'll see that a.foo is, uh, is called twice uh, from two receiver objects, a1 and a2. In a context insensitive analysis, this relationship is missed. And as we walk through the program, this becomes more of a problem in context insensitive analysis where we miss many, many more relationships than there actually are. But on the right, we'll see that context sensitive analysis includes all the relationships between uh, our two methods. And it also highlights which receiver object instantiated the call. By isolating these uh, context snapshots, we can look closely into different dynamic states of the program. Uh, here is the, the graph again, for example. Uh, it's important to note that this graph, although complete, is 
all possible dynamic states of the program. But any given time in a single threaded application, uh, we can only be in one state. So a.foo can either be called by a1 or a2, but not by both simultaneously. Now to, to distinguish this fact, we extract snapshots. A snapshot is a small example of a dynamic state of a program, which we can derive from the context insensitive graph. So in this example, this is a call trace when the receiver object is A1. And the second snapshot is the call trace when the receiver object is A2 and so on. So for every receiver object in our call graph, we get a small subgraph that indicates the dynamic state of that program. Along the same lines, we can also extract snapshots that have to do with database transactions. Since the DJI graph has uh, transaction relationships, we can extract subgraphs from the DJI graph, which indicate interactions between the database tables and the classes in the program. Now, once we do this, we have uh, a set of discrete snapshots, which we can then use to apply this algorithm called uh, label propagation, which tries to identify communities in, in, in the graph. Um, so label propagation works with uh, a set of initial assignments, and then it tries to propagate those assignments through the entire graph to identify partitions in, in the graph. So these initial assignments uh, can be random, um, in, 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 in which case it would be completely unsupervised, but they can also have, uh, they can also be user preferred assignments if there are any specific preferences on grouping all the, all the classes that handle the web interface together as well as database interactions, those can be used as initial assignments. Or we could also use other partitioning algorithms and use them as an initial assignment to run label propagation. Essentially, what label propagation does is once we have an initial label, uh, each node gets the label of its neighbors in a greedy manner. And this, this process is repeated until convergence. That is, there are no more changes to the, the coloring of the nodes, and that indicates the uh, termination of label propagation. So in our approach, uh, Cargo, uh, which comes with DGI, we apply label propagation to each of the snapshots that I just discussed. So as an example, we would initialize labels, and let's assume that this is our DGI graph. Uh, we would start by looking at the transaction snapshot and perform label propagation on the transactions. And what happens now in this, in this view is all the classes that either read from or write to a database table get grouped together with that database table. And in essence, this enforces a sort of uh, a database per service pattern. And once we have the labels for the database interactions, we then run context uh, label propagation on each context snapshot. So in this example, we would propagate the labels for this snapshot and likewise we can do this for the other snapshot until we've propagated the labels through the entire program and once cargo um, terminates we would have uh, partition assignments for every class and uh, database table in the program so that's the overview uh, we've packaged cargo as part of dji uh, uh, it's also available as a standalone tool um, and it has a lot of options for enhancing how the label propagation behaves, uh, soliciting user feedback to initialize the label propagation and so on. So I wanna go over uh, the evaluation, right? Uh, just to kind of uh, complete the, the thought process on how Cargo works and how it performs compared to some other algorithms. So we looked at a few um, applications as shown here. Uh, they belong to several Java frameworks, they have a number of classes. These are toy examples, so there are just a few hundred classes in, in many cases, uh, and uh, a, few, a few SQL tables. We also looked at some additional approaches that are available in scientific literature, like Monitor Micro and a few others. Um, and we used these, uh, these algorithms along with Cargo to see if uh, running DJI and Cargo can enhance the partitioning recommendations of these. And when we do that in our experiments, we use the notation uh, plus plus for brevity. We um, looked at a few research questions here to see if this technique works. We evaluated how effective it is in remediating distributed transactions. Uh, we looked at the latency and throughput improvements that we might get when we deployed these as running microservices. And we also looked at the 
partitioning quality and architectural metrics that we might obtain if we were to partition the monolith using Cargo. Uh, the first question was looking at distributed transactions. So we wanted to minimize distributed transactions. And to do this, to the extent possible, we want each database table to be accessed by just one uh, microservice partition. And uh, to measure that, there is a, a measure called transaction purity, which measures how pure transactions are. Uh, if the transaction purity is low, that means that a table is accessed by multiple microservices, potentially leading to uh, needing a distributed transaction management. If the transaction purity is high, uh, it means that a table is accessed by only one microservice and all the data access remains local to that microservice. And this is just a quick comparison of all the techniques. Uh, I'd like to note here that plus plus indicates that we used cargo on the partitioning assignments that were given to us by the other algorithms. And we observe that in most cases without using cargo, um, the transactional purity was quite low, which meant that if we were to implement the, trans uh, the partitioning as per these algorithms, we would have to reconcile with a lot of distributed transactions. But um, using cargo to, to refine these partitions considerably reduced the incidence of distributed transactions. While it didn't fully eliminate them, it made them um, much fewer in number so that it's, it's easy to, to handle. And finally, uh, just running cargo without any seed examples in a random manner also achieved a transaction purity of one, meaning it could partition the application in a manner such that all the tables were local to the partitions. In addition to just looking at transactions, we um, we deployed two versions of the applications uh, as microservices. The first one was the original partitioning algorithm with a technique called mono to micro. And the second one, we used Cargo to refine these partitions and to kind of look at if we can get uh, improved latency and uh, higher throughput. And uh, we ran these on uh, various loads with uh, ranging from 2,000 to a million users on a number of use cases. And the key takeaway here is that in all cases, using Cargo uh, and, and DJI to do this refactoring uh, improved the latency or reduced it by 11% and increased the throughput by about 120%, which was quite considerable in our use case. And finally, um, we have to talk about cohesion and coupling, which we use to evaluate uh, the architectural quality of these partitions. Uh, we measured some of these metrics, and we observed that, again, using Cargo uh, reduced the coupling and increased cohesion um, of the applications compared to the state-of-the-art techniques. There are some examples where uh, we think Cargo could uh, could do better. One example is business context purity, which uh, which measures how closely tied each partition is to a business use case. Now, since Cargo does not, at its current state, use any business context, it didn't really do well at uh, creating partitions that stuck to a specific domain. And uh, and we think with uh, with some additional work. Uh, and by engaging the community, we can we can make the partitions from Cargo more aligned with the domains that they uh, they tackle. All right, so this is a quick summary of Cargo um, and all I spoke about. Um, I want to do a quick demo and just show you how we can use Cargo uh, from DJI. So Cargo is available as a standalone PyPy package, um, and it's. It's used as one of the dependencies in DJI. So when you install DJI using PyPy, it should come uh, in pre-built with Cargo, but there is a standalone tool in case uh, there are options to enhance some of the partitioning functionalities in Cargo. Okay, so I'm gonna clear the screen here. And to use Cargo, it comes as a subcommand of DJI, uh, and that is DJI partition. And I'm just going to ask for help here so we can see how we would invoke it from the command line. So DJI partition uh, has a few options. The seed input, uh, it's optional. But if we do provide it, 
it consumes the user desired seed partitions. So if you have some preferences on classes belonging to a specific microservice, this is the place to provide it. It doesn't have to be exhaustive and it does not have to cover all the classes. Any recommendations or preferences can be provided and the partitioning algorithm will try to respect those, uh, those uh, initial partitions. And along with that, we have other uh, options like maximum partition size. If, uh, if there is a preference on having just three or four microservices, for example, that could be provided as an option. Uh, but this is also optional. So if you don't provide any um, number, Cargo will interpret a same partition uh, size and it will use that internally. And to use cargo, we just call uh, cargo with one of these options. So I'm just going to call it with uh, a partition size of five. Uh, and once you do that, it uh, so it's this is going to take a few minutes, but I'll just walk you through what is happening underneath. Cargo is looking at the DJI graph that we showed, uh, and it's going to make a local copy of it because we didn't want to make it. Uh, uh, tied to any specific graph database or technology. So it's going to make a local copy, run the partitioning algorithm as I described, find that the partitions for every class, and then update the DJI graph with a new property for every node indicating the, the uh, partition. So I'm going to go back to this view. Um, and we ran cargo once. And I'm just going to show you what uh, it might look like. So these are all the classes in the application um, or a set of classes that we can visualize. And right now they're all gray. Uh, but if you look at any one of these classes, uh, market summary bean, for example, uh, it should have a partition ID. Uh, likewise, another class could have would have another partition ID. And these partitions were obtained by running cargo. Uh, to visualize it better, we have some rules here that we can use. Uh, I'm just going to apply a unique color to every partition. And this view gives us an example of all the classes in the application. And each color rec represents classes that belong to that specific partition. An obvious question here is how could this be useful apart from visualizing classes in different partitions? Right? Um, one thing DJI can help with is to visualize distributed transactions. So even after we do um, cargo, uh, there are cases where we'll have distributed transactions. And it is important to remediate them. Uh, so by running the distributed transactions command, uh, we have some cipher queries we use to compute distributed transactions. It should populate a graph that contains tables, classes, and the distributed transactions, as we see here. Um, the larger blocks here indicate uh, components that are more central. And you'll observe here that there are classes that are colored differently, indicating that they belong to different microservices. So we see at least three, uh, four microservices here, with yellow, um, lavender, and orange. And they all talk to uh, certain databases. As an example, we can uh, pick a set of classes to see what interactions they have. And this is a quick example of the quote EJB table having transaction rights from two different classes, one from a ping EJB class and another from a servlet class. And they're both reading uh, from the quote EJB table. And uh, if you look at the property of every transaction read, we have a unique transaction ID. And in cases where the transaction ID is the same, uh, for this, in this example, uh, the transactions would be potentially distributed because they're both part of the same global transaction that are right reading from the from the database. So that's a quick example of uh, of what we can do with Cargo and DJI and visualize the various interactions and distributed transactions. Um, that brings me to the end of my talk. I want to hand it back to John, who will talk you through some additional use cases that we have in mind or do you thank, John? yeah thank thanks for all so um if we could just bring up my slide <clears throat> thank you so future work so this is this is where you come in <laughs> right one of the things that we could do well 
if you look at the output of DJI, which we didn't show you, it's like just a JSON file or 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 forget if it's a plain text file, but it's nothing to look at. So the idea is, you know, could we create some reports that an architect could go back, right, or a software engineer could go back and say, you know, this is the output and these are the recommendations for partitions and whatnot. So there's some reporting that we want to add to it. Um, as I mentioned, we want to have dynamic operational data. So doing some dynamic scanning traces through the program as it's running, right? And add that to the graph. Again, once again, understand, yeah, okay, this is calling that, but is it calling it once at the beginning or, you know, a thousand times a second? New languages. Right now, DJI only works with Java, but, you know, Java is not the center of the universe. So there's lots of Java out there, but, you know, Python and Go are becoming very, very popular for microservices, you know, could we use other languages and, and, uh, and especially in C-sharp, there's lots of Windows stuff out there and whatnot. Um, enhancing the support for the Java frameworks that we have, right? Spring Boot and other frameworks, right? Adding more frameworks that we understand. Remember I talked about the model view controller and can we, by understanding the framework, can we, you know, inference what, what these classes are being used for? Um, then support for distributed transactions and being able to generate code, being able to generate code that uses saga patterns, right? So, so in other words, you know, you, great, you give the, the architect this report. Now, what do you go do, right? Now, it's, it's an exercise for the student. So we would like to be able to generate code, generate stubs, uh, and, and take care of distributed transactions. We need a UI for visualization. It's great using Bloom. It got us pretty far, uh, but we would love to have, you know, someone who understands, you know, human computer interaction, really build that 3D view where we could turn things around and look behind them and look under them and see what's going on. So it's kind of screaming for a really cool uh, visualization that we need to build. And then we're using Diva, which is another conveyor project, and uh, and it has a set of persistence frameworks that it supports, and there's always more persistence frameworks. So we're looking at enhancing the persistence frameworks in Diva, whether we do them as part of Diva or we do them as a set of adapters, either here or there. Love to have the community's input on, on what you think is the best way to do that, but enhancing the frameworks, the persistence frameworks that we support so that we can understand the uh, distributed transactions going on. We are currently uh, enhancing schema to graph, looking at triggers. Right. So it's great to understand here's a schema, here's a relationship. And then what about all those triggers that when this gets updated, that automatically gets updated and then the application doesn't know what's going on? Uh, what about stored procedures? Right? There's lots of stuff with stored procedures out there. And so could we use the information from the stored procedures to understand again what when when this is being updated, is something else being updated? What, what's happening? Um, and then what can you think of for future work? Um, you know, open an issue. Let us know what you think. If there's other ideas that you have, we would love for you to join us and help us build this. Uh, and so the the um, the pointer to the GitHub repository is down there at the bottom. Um, we're using actually using uh, GitHub projects. So we got a Kanban board. We got stories on the Kanban board. Uh, but we would love for the community to come help us. You know, we think we got it to a point where you can kind of visualize the potential that's here. But we need your help. Uh, we need more hands-on to under and people who have you know talent in other you know areas, not just Java, but C sharp and whatnot, um, and visualization and and uh, but we need your help to make this thing as uh, as cool as we possibly can, right? To be really useful and and there is there's never going to be a tool where you push the button and it makes microservices. You're always going to need an architect who's guiding it along the way. So I, I totally believe that. The tool needs to assist the architect in making architectural decisions. Give them all the information they need to make those decisions, show them different ways of viewing their application. But at the end of the day, I would not hire an insurance architect to uh, re-architect my banking application, right? I want somebody who understands the banking industry. So you need to have that context. Uh, and so we vision this as a tool that is going to assist the software engineer, the architect, who's going to re-architect or redesign this application uh, and help them understand you know, where those big heavy objects are and where the microservices are and where the business domains should be. So please come help us. <laughs> I'm pleading with you. <laughs> um, but we'd love to have you, you know, join, join the team, join the community and, uh, and help us make this into something great. So Jonathan, back to you. Um, <laughs> that was my plea. <laughs> awesome. Thank you, John. Thank you, Rahul. Such an awesome um, demo and, and show. So for anyone, if you have any questions, feel free to put it in the chat right now while we have John and Rahul here. We can get them to answer a few. And in case you don't have any questions now, but you may so later whenever you have whenever you start getting trying to use the tool, 
I put the link to the conveyor Slack channel in the comments, and you can see on the screen now, it's just a conveyor channel on the Kubernetes Slack. So feel free to jot any questions you have there and, and we'll get someone to help you with that. Yeah, we'd and, love it. Let me see. And at the moment, I don't see any questions. Um, but that may just be people are typing. So I'll give it a few minutes. It's a lot to absorb. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> All right. So from Marcus Noggle, have you planned any DGI specific meetings to hammer out task and sync? So that's a great, yeah, that's a great question. So yeah, I think it's time to do that. So I, so we've been, we've been having internal meetings, but now that we've announced it to the community, I agree. It's time to have a weekly, you know, community meeting or maybe a, a, a semi-weekly community meeting where we're discussing these and having our scrum call, so to speak. Um, so, so yes, we will, we will post that on the, uh, uh, in, in the readme in our uh, DGI repo, but yes, it's time to have community meetings now. So we will start those up. Absolutely. And hopefully you'll join us. We it won't just be the same people. <laughs> no, and I want a community meeting. <clears throat> Thank you, John. Anyone else have any questions? All right. Um, well, with that, we're going to call it a show. And John, Raul, thank you again so much. And people will be pinging you in Slack if, once they get to, to using it. Yeah, thanks for having us. And thanks for listening, everyone. And yeah, hit us up on Slack and, and interact with us because we do want to start building that community with you. So thanks. All right, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thanks again for attending. Bye. Bye-bye.